Now that we know that Jesus is the bread of life, the rivers of water, now we're going to find out what else he is in John 8. So we're going through festival times in John at the moment. We started out with Sabbath. Then last week we were talking about the festival of the booths or what you call Sukkoth. I know my um, sound modifier kind of cuts off the end of the word, but there's a TH at the end of it. This is where we celebrate Moses and the people being led by God in a pillar of light and the tabernacle, which is the portable place that God lives, the portable temple. Jesus is going through these festival times. I heard something kind of interesting when I was going through John 8, and it was saying that these winter to spring festivals are before Jesus dies or the first time Jesus comes to earth. The autumn festivals are where we're going to talk about Jesus coming back again. I never heard that before, but that's pretty cool. I don't think I emphasized enough the fact that when he's talking about the bread of life, the river of water, and the light, he is alluding back to this situation where they were walking through the desert. God provided food for the people. He provided water for the people. And he led them with a pillar of light, of fire. He was there with them in that presence all the time. We're going to think about that. We're going to think about our time in Exodus. And so it's going to mean a lot to everyone at right this time. You can imagine that if we were bringing up images of Christmas, we would talk about Christmas imagery and we go, oh, I get that, right? So in this particular case, those are some of the imageries we've had. And John is very deep. He is a very deep, deep thinker about all of these things. We hear the similar messages in the Synoptic Gospels of him being the light and everything else like that. And our very first story I mentioned last time, It says that the earliest manuscripts don't include 753 to 811. So they usually kind of combine these two passages into the start of chapter 8. It's a great story. I think it's a great imagery of Jesus. And I hope it's true. I really do. I really hope that it's part of it. But even if it isn't, it doesn't change, I think, the message of John 8 at all. But just keep in mind that some of the earlier pieces don't have this particular aspect in it. But it is the story of the woman. They're up on Mount of Olives and they come to the temple again. And the people are all, you know, there. He started sitting down and teaching them right in the middle of the temple. This is ground zero for the Pharisees and everything else. The Pharisees bring a woman who was caught in adultery. It says places her in their midst. You sort of get this image of them sort of tossing her in the middle of all of them. Hey, this woman's caught in adultery. Now, we're going to have to stone her. I mean, that's what the law of Moses says. Well, interesting thing enough, that is not what the law of Moses says. They're lying about that. It is not what they're calling for. So they're wrong about it in general. But again, this is a test. They're trying to put Jesus into these situations about taxes and about everything else. So either he goes against the people or he makes a judgment that's wrong. Again, they don't think much of him because, oh, he wasn't educated. He's that kid that grew up in Nazareth. What is he? Jesus said that he wrote, bent down and he wrote with his finger on the ground. And then they continued to ask. So he stood up and he said, well, let him who is without sin throw the first stone. Famous, famous verse. And then he started bending down again and writing on the ground all over again. And when they heard what he said, it says they went away one by one beginning with the older ones. And then Jesus was there with the woman alone. And he said, where are they? No one's condemned you. And she says, no one, Lord, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is a great passage. And it's such a wonderful passage to talk about God. I did a lot of research. Different commentaries tried to talk about what it was that Jesus wrote in the ground. And some of them were like, well, we're not really sure. Um, certainly we want to be careful when we're not specifically told what it is. The interesting thing about it is that someone with the the Ascension Group, and that's with Father Mike Schmidt and the Bible in a Year reading, which is a Catholic organization, said, we know probably what he wrote down because we're at the Festival of the Booths. We talked about this history of him being the salt and the light and the bread and the r- rivers of water. 
This is all talked about in Jeremiah 17. He is coming to this whole culmination, and it starts talking about Judea's sin. This is the southern kingdom. And then goes on to talk about my mountain in the land and your wealth and your treasures. Of course, this is Mount Zion or Jerusalem. But then it says, cursed is the one who trusts in man. So they're going to know all this, right? And, and so you, I guess the point of what this idea is, they're biblical scholars. Jesus talks to people at their level of knowledge. They know what it says. They will know Jeremiah very, very well, and they'll know what he's doing. Jeremiah 17 goes on to say, those who put their trust in the Lord is like those who plant a tree by water, sends out roots into the stream, doesn't fear when the heat comes, right? If you believe, if you understand with your heart, you'll know these things and you'll be like that tree. It goes on to say, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. We've talked about the water and the rivers of water and how you should be planted by it. And now it says, you, you know, the name is going to be written in the dust one by one. And so what this opinion was, is what Jesus was writing in the dust was the name of each of the rabbis there in order of age. And they walked away in order of age, one by one, as I saw their name being written down. Whoa, isn't that amazing? I was pretty much convinced that I couldn't really talk about anything about this because we don't know and we're not sure what it says. Wow, that is such an amazing moment. And then he says he doesn't condemn her. Now, this is very famous, right? This is a very famous speech. And so people will say, well, this is saying you shouldn't condemn people. You shouldn't judge people or something like that. Or that God forgives everything. Look at that. He is with this woman who committed adultery. People kind of forget that, first of all, the problem with what the Pharisees were doing was hypocrisy. They weren't looking at the plank in their own eyes and then blaming this woman. They were not free of sin. The second thing that we don't tend to read when we look at this passage in modern media, I guess, to say is go now and sin no more. It wasn't just enough. Okay, you're free to go. This is what you got to do next. I'm not going to condemn you. Go be without sin. We are not meant, even when we're forgiven, to continue in sin. Wow. So that is just one of the most amazing texts right there. I, I just thought that was so interesting. Jesus goes on to say, I'm the light of the world. We saw that in the beginning, there was light. You know, Jesus was there from the beginning and he is the light of the world. And it says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This is the SV. In the commentaries, there were discussions. There are things that Jesus told to people that was just meant for them, like Lazarus, get up and rise out of the grave. For him, right? Not for all of us or for everybody. There are some things he says that are meant for everybody. And this is one of them for sure. But there are promises that God gives to us. And then there are sometimes promises that are conditional. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. I think about this whole point of it. You will walk in light. What does it mean to walk in light? Well, you don't trip over things. You don't fall into pits. You don't get hurt. <laughs> you see God, I think, in that light. And you see, most importantly, yourself. And I think the rest of the world in light there are parts of Isaiah that talks about the light that you're going to see. This is an important thing. There are Things that God tells us to do because our salvation depends on it. Coming back to not be left with the weeds and instead be with the wheat, right? In this case, he's not, I think, talking about salvation, but saying you'll walk in light. You will have light. You, things will be illuminated to you. You will understand what is going on. A friend of mine and I were talking the other day about things that are in the Bible this is the way you should live. And there are things in the Bible that are, this is what your salvation depends on. And I think this falls into that category. This is how you should live. Follow me. <laughs> Someone was saying that this follow me is very complex Greek. It means, uh, yeah, walk right behind me in my path. We know what it means to follow someone. Follow Jesus and you will have that light. Almost, I think, too, like that pillar in the desert where God says, follow me. I'm going to show you your new land. Follow me. And he's going to be the light in the desert during the day. He's going to be the light at night that keeps the animals away. 
light does many good things for us. So the Pharisees are saying, wait, are you bearing witness about yourself? You're not right. Jesus says, you know what? Even if I am bearing witness about myself, I'm true because where I came from, where I'm going, and you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You look at the, the flesh, the, the, the physical things, the washed cups or the washed hands or the Sabbath wheat. You know, you're paying attention to the things of this world, the way the world looks at it. And you know what? Even if I judge and my judgment is true, even if I testify and my testimony is true, it is because it's not just me by myself, but me and the Father together. The God you worship that you've been looking for, you're not, you're not looking for the Holy Spirit, you're not looking for the Messiah, but I'm telling you, me and the Father, who you do worship, we're one. We're together on this. And the Father bears witness to me. Well, where's your Father? So now they're either being obtuse or they just don't get it. You know, he's probably dead, right? You don't know my Father, because if you knew me, you would also know my Father. And so it says that he spoke the words in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And then no one would arrest him because it says his hour didn't come. It also mentioned in the other gospels, they didn't arrest him because they were afraid of the people when, they, when he was in Jerusalem because he had a gathering. But the point of all of this is that the Father and Jesus are one. If you're thinking you're worshiping the Father, but not me, you got it all wrong. We're together on this. Wow. This whole, this whole point that Jesus is making with the bread, the river of water, and now the light comes together in this festival of the booths. This would have been meaningful to them and during this holiday. And you know, the funny thing of it is, is that there was a time in my life when I was Jewish, and then I became a Christian, and I never drew these two things together. So I find that whole thing fascinating. The other part that I liked about the light is there's this famous joke that had a drunk person and he was looking for his keys and a police officer comes up and says, well, what are you looking for? And he says, oh, I lost the keys to my house. Oh, did you lose them here? No, I lost them in the dark alley, but the light is here and I'm only here I can see what I'm doing. We only see what we're doing and we can only find our keys when we're in the light, right? So then he says, you know what? I'm going away and you're going to look for me and you will die in your sins because where I'm going, you can't come. Oh, so you're going to kill yourself because we can't go to the afterworld without you? And he says, no, where I'm going, you can't come because you are from below and I am from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. You're going to die in your sins unless you believe I am. So, you know, they were like, well, who are you? You know, when you say I am, again, this is going to be God, right? But they're either, like I said, being ignorant of this. They're not getting it. Or they're purposely trying to say, you're, you're not clearly saying you're God here, right? That's not what you're saying. I have much to say about you, much to judge, who sent me is true. I declare to the world what I have heard from him. I'm telling you God's truth. Now, it says that they didn't understand that he'd been speaking about the Father. How many times in the gospel God talked about, if you have ears here, if you have a mind, you know, think, believe, if you have a heart, let it enter your heart. It's not that they were dumb. They were educated. Either they did not want to get this. They were shielding themselves from this truth. But one way or the other, they didn't get this at all. And then he says, then you'll know I am he, that I do nothing on my own authority, but I speak as the Father taught me. He is the one who sent me. He has not left me alone. And I always do things that are pleasing to him. When he said that, it said many people believed. And so to the Jews that did believe him, if you abide by my word, if, again, a conditional, you're truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. This is another passage that gets quoted all the time, but it doesn't mean mostly what people quote it. They love to quote it. The, the world outside of the Christian faith loves to quote it. The truth will set you free. But what are you enslaved by? People in the modern world, oh, you will know the truth of the world. It will set you free. A, a more, again, physical, earthly type of freedom. And here he goes on and says, well, you know, we are offsprings of Abraham. We've never been slaves. How can you say we'll be free? Again, not getting it because, first of all, it is curious because the people of Israel were enslaved by Egypt, so they weren't free. 
They were exiled by Syria, Babylon. They were sacked by Greek and Rome and were currently under Roman occupation. I think Parthia was also a nation that sacked them as well. What do you mean you're free? You know, you were never a slave to anyone. You have been subjugated and marched in and out of here by many people. And maybe they were thinking of it in terms of Judah versus Samaria, or I read a lot of commentaries that was kind of going into that very deeply. Your sons of Abraham, fine. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, but you'll be a son. You know, but the sun remains forever. And if the sun sets you free, you will be free. We are slaves to our sins. And we, throughout probably all times, but I think more so now, or maybe at least particularly now, we look at our sins as freedom. We are glad about our sins. We are happy about our sins. We celebrate our sins. That's what all our movies and our television shows are about. This woman coming back three o'clock in the morning to her house going, oh man, you know, I slept with 300 guys. Why are you boasting? <laughs> we are in that path where we are happy about our sins. We boast about our sins. And God is saying, you are slaves to them. I think about, this is maybe a, a bit unkind, but my father, he was someone who thought he was free because he could do what he wanted. He wasn't bound by any of these stupid religions, you know, kind of thing. I'm free. I'm free to do what I want. I'm a free man. And he drank himself into a tizzy. He was horrible to everyone around him when he was drunk. And he couldn't get away with it. It was a trap he set himself into. And when we find our own sins, you know, I see people discuss this all this time, particularly if you watch a lot of Bible podcasts and things on the internet. I was really into gambling or I was really into internet videos. And then suddenly I was trapped. Suddenly, I, w I couldn't get out. And then when I would try to get out and I would get counseling, I would just fall back into it. You're not free when you cannot escape something. You did what Abraham would do. You would know me, but you're trying to kill me. That's not what Abraham did. Abraham was obedient to God. You are doing previous sins of your father that kill prophets, that fall away from God. This is not. God's doing. Because if God were really your father, you would love me because I came from God. I am here. It says not of my own accord, but he who sent me. Why don't you understand what I'm saying to you? Hear my words. Your father is of the devil and you're doing your father's desire. You are of the things of earth. You are things of then therefore sin. You're not thinking of the things of heaven because if you were, you would be believing me. And the devil is the father of lies. We knew that from Adam and Eve. The devil is very slick in what he says. He just changes the truth a little bit. I think all these messages you get about what God wants, you just change it a little bit and you're no longer telling the truth of God. You're telling a truth you want to hear, like they were divorcing their wives. Well, God doesn't want me to have a wife who can't cook properly. He wants me to be happy. He wants me to have a wife that honors me and God. They got around everything they were trying to do. And I tell you the truth and you don't believe me. Boy, he is calling them out. People around him are accusing him of being a Samaritan. There was this whole thing when you're having a war with people and you don't like them and you're starting to call names and put people down. Oh, well, they were from Cain. They weren't from Seth or, you know, something like that. And it gets into this very convoluted story about from the beginning. The Samaritans were always born of the devil. So they just decided to call Jesus names. And he's like, you know what? I don't have a demon. I honor my father and you dishonor me. Wow. If anyone keeps my word, he'll, not, he'll never see death. And so now they're all offended. Are you better than Abraham? He died. The prophets died. Everyone died. And he said, it's the father that glorifies him. He is our God. You don't know him. Who, your father, Abraham, looked forward to see this day and he saw it and was glad. Oh, how, how can that be? You're not even 50 years old. Abraham was a really long time ago. Then Jesus says the most interesting thing of this whole chapter eight, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Oh boy, picked up stones. 
to throw him at him, but Jesus went out and hid and went out of the temple. He's saying it right there. You know, we heard him say before in other synoptic gospels that he knew David. Now he's saying before Abraham, I was there. Because John says it from the beginning, God was, and he was the light and the word from the very beginning. Wow. Deep stuff, right? Oh, my goodness. The whole time I'm reading all of this, I'm just awestruck about how every one of these festivals is being used. What I'm going to meditate about today is how Jesus fulfills these festivals, these scriptures, these points that no one could tie together, particularly an uneducated man like this. Nobody could do what he is doing. I think what happens is that when you get into religion and faith, you tie your strings together. And someone said, Jesus is going to come back and it's going to be a surprise to us all because we're also probably in a lot of ways tying our own strings together. And when it happens for real and we see how it plays out, some of us are going to go, oh, I get it now. This is what you're talking about. The bread, the water, the light. I get it. And other people are going to be like, what are you even talking about? I don't get this at all, either because we're obstinate or because we're limited in our thinking. We're thinking of earthly things. So I'm going to meditate on that. What I'm going to pray about is that God always lets me look into the light and see the heavenly things, that I don't walk into the dark. The darkness, I love the darkness in stars and us and auroras and all those things. He's not talking about that kind of light and dark. He is talking about the truth the heavenly truth and seeing God and seeing ourselves and seeing the word and seeing the world in the way God sees it. And what I'm going to share with others is that Jesus says, before Abraham, I am. He was there from the beginning. He was there from before Abraham. If the people who say they're following Abraham really did, they'd be believing in Jesus. What a powerful message. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. There is some deep stuff in all of this. I hope you're enjoying that. Please remember, you're always welcome to email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you. Or you can also message me on Twitter. I have decided to consolidate my Twitter into one account. It is just too much to have all these accounts. So the show notes will have my accurate Twitter account. You're welcome to follow me. I post updates on this podcast and things that might be of interest to you. And thanks again for listening.